Coming up on New Day at Arirang. President Yoon suk yeol made his debut on the global stage during the second global COVID-19 summit on Thursday. In a pre-recorded speech, Yoon pledged more support for the international community to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. North Korea fired three short-range ballistic missiles on Thursday, its 16th show of force this year and first under the new Yoon administration. Washington condemned the latest provocation but says it remains committed to engaging with Pyongyang in dialogue. The United Nations Human Rights Council voted Thursday to investigate alleged human rights abuses by Russian forces near Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, and other regions of the country. China was among just two countries that voted against the resolution. Hello and welcome to New Day at Arirang. It's Friday, May 13th, 8 a.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Oh Siang. And I'm Lee Seung Jae. Thanks again for tuning in this morning because over the next hour, we'll be giving you the biggest headlines of the day and, of course, experts' insights on some of the key issues facing Korea and the rest of the world. Now, our top story this morning, attending the second virtual COVID-19 summit jointly hosted by the U.S., Belize, Germany, Indonesia and Senegal. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said the country will provide more financial resources for the global pandemic partnership. He also stressed that Seoul will continue to fulfill its duties in the international community to end the pandemic. Our Kim yo has this story. South Korean President Yoon sung yeol pledged more support for the international community to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The pledge was made in a pre-recorded video message addressing the second global COVID-19 summit held virtually on Thursday. Act A에 3억 불의 재원을 추가로 기여할 것입니다. 시급히 백신이 필요한 국가들에게 충분한 공급과 안전하고 빠른 접종을 지원하겠습니다. The additional support comes on top of the 210 million US dollars of cash and goods provided by Seoul to the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator or Act A, an initiative launched by the WHO and global partners to provide COVID-19 vaccines, treatment and test kits. Yoon further emphasized that South Korea will continue to fulfill its responsibility and role within the international community and support its efforts to end the pandemic. Underscoring the fact that no one country can end the pandemic alone, he also endorsed the establishment of a financial intermediary fund so that the global community can swiftly mobilize financial resources to effectively tackle health crises going forward. Attending the summit, U.S. President Joe Biden appealed to world leaders for a renewed international commitment to fighting COVID-19. He called on the U.S. Congress to provide additional funds so that Washington can contribute more to the global COVID-19 response. Today I'm announcing the United States will share critical COVID-19 technologies through the World Health Organization COVID-19 Technology Access Pool. We're making available health technologies that are owned by the United States government, including stabilized spike protein that is used in many COVID-19 vaccines. The White House explained that the summit has gathered over $3 billion in new funding to fight the pandemic, including over $2 billion in immediate response, as well as more than $960 million in commitment to the World Bank Pandemic Preparedness Fund. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. North Korea says around 18,000 people tested positive for COVID-19 on Thursday and reported six related deaths. This comes as the regime's state-run media reported Thursday that the North had identified its first infection, calling the situation a, quote, major national emergency. The Korean Central News Agency said Kim Jong-un visited the National Quarantine Emergency Command Center, where he explained that the spread proves there are loopholes in the North's quarantine system. The report added that over 350,000 North Koreans have suffered from unidentified fever since late April, of which around 160,000 have fully recovered. North Korea on Thursday fired three ballistic missiles towards the East Sea. This marks the regime's 16th provocation of the year, the first since the launch of the UN administration earlier this week. Pyeongji has the full details. At about 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, the South Korean military said North Korea launched a total of three short-range ballistic missiles toward the East Sea. 
Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff said they were fired from the North's Sunan area in its capital city of Pyongyang. That's the same area where the North on March 24th conducted its first full ICBM test since 2017. The military said the missiles flew about 360 kilometers at an altitude of around 90 kilometers. The latest launch reportedly involved a multiple rocket launcher, and it's the first time that the North has ever test-fired three missiles consecutively. This comes just three days after the newly inaugurated President Yoon suk yeol took office on Tuesday. It also comes after the South Korean military said earlier in the day that it has now decided to use the word missile and officially classify it as a provocation rather than just a threat. This is in line with the new administration's promise that it will deal sternly with provocations from North Korea. North Korea's series of missile launches recently are serious provocations that pose a threat to the Korean Peninsula, as well as international peace and security. We strongly urge the North to immediately put a halt to its actions. In fact, on Thursday, in a text message to reporters right after the launch, the military wrote that the North fired a ballistic missile. Normally, the military would use the word projectile instead. Following the launch, the presidential office convened a meeting of its National Security Council, where they condemned the North's actions. It also said the government will take practical and stern measures against the provocation. Seoul's ambassador to the United Nations also condemned Pyongyang's recent missile test during a Security Council meeting in New York on Wednesday and urged the North to commit to complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. The phrase, often abbreviated as CVID, marks a shift in tone in South Korea's policy towards North Korea. Pae Eun-ji, Arirang News. South Korea and the United States have condemned North Korea's latest missile launches, but left the door open for humanitarian support after the regime acknowledged its first case of COVID-19. On Thursday, South Korea's National Security Office described the launch as, quote, a serious threat to peace and security. It also slammed what it called the North's two-faced actions in continuing to carry out missile provocations while neglecting its people's lives and safety amid the pandemic. Now, the White House said the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and his South Korean counterpart Kim Sung-han condemned the North's launches during a phone call on Thursday. They also discussed U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Seoul later this month. The U.N. has decided to investigate potential Russian war crimes in Ukraine despite Moscow's repeated denial of abusing civilians. Meanwhile, Finland and Sweden have also expressed their desire to join NATO, to which Russia warned of retaliation. Lee kyung has the details. With an overwhelming majority, the U.N. Human Rights Council decided to investigate possible Russian war crimes in Ukraine. It passed a resolution on Thursday amid calls by protesters in front of the U.N. headquarters in Geneva and an accusation by Ukraine of, quote, endless list of crimes. The areas of Kyiv, Chernihiv, Sumy, Kharkiv regions, which have been under Russian occupation in late February and March, have experienced the most gruesome human rights violations on the European continent in decades. Russia left the seat empty in protest. China, shifting from its previous stance of abstaining on Ukraine, voted against the decision alongside Eritrea. Moscow denies any civilian abuses in what it calls a special military operation in Ukraine to rid the country of anti-Russian nationalism driven by the West. But the U.N. is currently investigating what they say may amount to war crimes, signing the bodies of over a thousand civilians recovered in Kyiv and other regions. The scale of unlawful killings, including indicia of summary executions in areas to the north of Kyiv, is shocking. While we have information about 300 such killings, the figures will continue to increase as new evidence becomes available. The investigation team is set to submit its progress in September and a final report by next March. Meanwhile, G7 foreign ministers are in North Germany to discuss global food shortages resulting from the Ukraine war until Saturday. Then, an unofficial NATO meeting will take place in Berlin. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will take part, as well as foreign ministers of Finland and Sweden. The two Nordic countries expressed a wish to join the defense alliance, overturning their long-held neutrality. Russia has warned of retaliation. Yang Eun, Arirang News.
President Yoon suk yeol on Friday will preside over a meeting to discuss the nation's broad economic and financial conditions. Joining the meeting will be Finance Minister Chu Kyung-ho and Bank of Korea Governor Lee Tang-yong, as well as experts in the field. A spokesperson for the president emphasized that the purpose of the meeting is to better protect people's livelihoods. President Yoon has been emphasizing the need to address economic dif difficulties, including soaring prices. The UN, UN administration's first supplementary budget focuses on helping those hit hardest by the pandemic. It will also be used to help cushion the impacts of surging consumer prices and to strengthen preventive measures against epidemics. Our Om Jung explains further. One of the most important promises of President Yoon suk yeol providing relief to small businesses hit by the pandemic is the centerpiece of the extra budget. Finance Minister Chu kyung ho on Thursday announced the details of the second supplementary budget of the year worth a record 46 billion U.S. dollars. 28 billion dollars of the budget as a whole will be spent directly by the central government, while the other 18 billion will be handed over to regional governments. Of the roughly 36.4 trillion won, more than 70 percent of it will go to help small businesses hit by the pandemic, covering all of their losses. He said each business that's had a drop in revenue because of social distancing will get up to 10 million won, or roughly $7,800. He added that the government plans to improve the compensation scheme so that losses can be fully covered. Around $2 billion will be used to provide loans and debt relief to small business owners and help them get back on their feet. Another big slice of around $4.7 billion will also be spent on strengthening preventive measures against COVID-19 and other diseases. This will include medical expenses and additional supplies of COVID-19 pills. Also, the government will allocate $2.4 billion for stabilizing consumer prices and people's livelihoods. Up to $7,800 will be given to some 2.2 million low-income households to support their purchasing power. Chu emphasized that the main source of the funds will be tax surpluses rather than debt. He said around $16.5 billion had been drawn from the expected tax surplus this year, and $11.4 billion is from other surplus resources and adjustments to government spending. Financing the extra budget without issuing government bonds will minimize the impact on the economy, including interest rates and prices. The debt-to-GDP ratio is expected to improve to 49.6 percent from 50.1 percent. He added that this year's surplus tax is expected to amount to some $41 billion, resulting mostly from a $23 billion rise in corporate tax revenue led by last year's earning surprise in the semiconductor and finance sectors. The government is to use around $7 billion of the supplementary budget to reduce the government's debt. Om ji Arirang News. The National Assembly's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee on Thursday adopted the nominee report at the confirmation hearing of Unification Minister nominee Kwon Young se now, The confirmation comes as both the ruling People Power Party and the main opposition Democratic Party agreed on Kwon for the post. The hearings for 18 members of Yoon's first cabinet have now been completed. Prime Minister nominee Han Duk Su has yet to be confirmed, while the Education Minister nominee resigned just days before his hearing. Now, President Yoon added SME's Minister Lee Young and Industry Minister Lee Chang Young to his cabinet. That's four new names added on Thursday. Kim Yun Sung gets us better acquainted with the officials. Day three since President Yoon suk yeol took office, and already more than half of his cabinet seats have been filled. The latest additions were made Thursday evening, SME's Minister Lee Young and Industry Minister Lee Chang Yang. Four cabinet seats were filled on Thursday alone, with Foreign and Interior Ministers Park Jin and Lee Sang Min added to the team earlier in the day. But some say that Yoon is rushing to fill his cabinet. 
Yoon's decision to appoint Park Jin and Lee Sang-min as ministers has especially stoked criticism, as Yoon decided to push ahead with the appointments despite the delay in the National Assembly's approval. Considering the time it took for past administrations to complete their starting cabinets, Yoon is moving at a faster pace to fill his. Some speculate that the rush was connected to Yoon's first cabinet meeting on Thursday. The meeting discussed an item that Yoon had time and time again stressed was urgent, the extra budget bill for pandemic-battered businesses. And to convene, Yoon needed a minimum of 11 people present. With freshly appointed ministers Park Jin and Lee Sang-min and two ministers from the Moon Jae-in administration joining the meeting, Yoon had just made it above the cut, with 12 attendees. SME's Minister Lee Young and Industry Minister Lee Chang-yang were not present, as their appointments had been made after the meeting took place. An official at the presidential office said on Thursday that the administration is mainly focusing on continuing state affairs without any holdups, as the country is trudging through difficult economic times, and as it has two monumental events, U.S.-South Korea summit and the local elections, coming up. But appointing a new prime minister may need more time, as the ruling and the opposition parties remain at a contentious gridlock over the Yunpik nominee Han Dok Su. Kim Yansen, Arirang News. It's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into key issues in the spotlight right now. Of course, as we mentioned earlier on, North Korea launched three short-range ballistic missiles on Thursday, the regime's first provocation since the South Korean president's inauguration this week. It was a move widely anticipated, though, almost a rite of passage for every South Korean president, but... The timing also coincided with the news of Pyongyang admitting for the first time that there had been an outbreak of COVID-19 within its borders. To discuss these latest developments, we connect with Professor Song tae Professor of Law at Gyeonggi University. A very warm welcome to you, Professor. Thank you for joining us. And well, first off, this uh, launch, uh, this launch of three short-range ballistic missiles by North Korea. Of course, it was a move that was anticipated, but we know that North Korea picks its timing very carefully. So what do you think was behind this launch and what do you think was the message that they were trying to convey? Good morning. Uh, there could be a number of and uh, probably a combination of reasons. Uh, I think that there is an element of a bully uh, flexing his muscle in front of the new kid in town, maybe test the medal of the new president. But uh, I think it's also that the provocation was done ahead of uh, President Joe Biden's visit to Korea next week. So we certainly will have to talk about North Korea. Uh, after Donald Trump's willingness to engage, North Korea has not been on the agenda for U.S. So I, I think this is a case where they're crying for attention, so to speak. Uh, but uh, there's also a situation where Euro Ukrainian war and Japan trying to take advantage of the situation to amend their constitution. I think the North Korea might feel the urgency to upgrade their military and nuclear capacity. Uh, but. Yet another reason could be that uh, it serves a, a domestic purpose uh, as a diversion to uh, North Korean people uh, to divert their attention to the achievements militarily rather than on the ills and dissatisfaction in the domestic front. So another thing that uh, we want to talk about is if any other country kind of reports on COVID-19 infections, that's nothing out of the norm, but it is when North Korea all of a sudden uh, reports on their COVID-19 outbreak, especially uh, two plus years of denials, uh, saying there's never been a case. Big question now is why now? Why admit that there has been an outbreak after two plus years? Well, uh, things might be getting out of hand, first of all. Uh, but another, the similar case is China. Uh, China. China is dealing with it uh, with a very harsh lockdown. North Korea may feel that they can be frank about it uh, to deal with it. Uh, another reason might be that uh, the North Korea is now finally asking for help for the wider community or global community, uh, maybe reaching out to COVAX or uh, maybe showing the sign that they might be willing to take some uh, aid from uh, even from South Korea or the U.S., uh, which I think is a little bit unlikely 
since they have the COVAX route. But it does show that uh, things are not uh, manageable uh, with uh, just a hush and, and keeping quiet about it. And Professor, well, here in South Korea, we saw just how rapidly this Omicron variant uh, just spiraled out of control here and tested you know, some of the best medical infrastructure in the world. But if this spreads in North Korea, then just how devastating is it going to be on the population? Uh, it could be very devastating. Uh, Omicron variant was uh, somewhat manageable in South Korea, uh, even with the high peaks for a while uh, in terms of death and uh, serious cases uh, uh, that there were pretty manageable. But that's because the vac vaccination rate in South Korea was very uh, high in the upwards of uh, uh, 80 percent. North Korea might be different in that regard. And uh, once the infection spreads, the fatality and the serious cases might uh, just jump really rapidly. So that that might be the situation. So it, it would be it would not be the same case or a similar case with the South Korean development of the COVID. So we saw with the uh, the new president uh, Yoon Suk Yeol uh, making his uh, global stage debut uh, with the uh, the COVID summit. Uh, now this could potentially be his first task when it comes to North Korea related issues. How do you suppose uh, Yoon Suk Yeol is going to respond to this? Is he going to give uh, humanitarian assistance? And also, what do you hope to see out of all this? Well, uh, South Korea has always been very open to uh, humanitarian uh, help on this. So uh, he, he might not be uh, very political about it. Ideally, uh, if South Korea provides aid, that would be met by North Korea's uh, willingness to refrain from provocations. But we have seen in the past that North will be North and we cannot rule out their uh, continued belligerent behavior to test the new administration uh, and serve their purposes, even with the aid provided. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, I think that the, the, the help provided by the South Korea is, is something that they can depend on if they choose to. Well, thank you very much for your insights today, Professor Song. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that wraps up our first half of New Day at Arirang. But stick around. More coming your way. We'll be back in just a moment. Now, the global economy is expected to improve slightly this year. And they've all dropped. But future economic, future economic indicators weren't so positive. Faster growth in emerging The U.S. China trade deal may be near, while a rally in global equity... For an economic outlook of South Korea's economy for 2020, we get a preview now from our business correspondent... Arirang. What matters?
Welcome to Dialogue this week. In this corner, we invite people from around the world to talk about a wide variety of issues, ranging from culture and sports to the latest global trends. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, one major trend we saw was the sales of NFT artwork skyrocketing as investors around the world snapped up digital artwork that are verifiable and indestructible. It's changing the way that art is being created, consumed and collected in the digital space. But what does all of this mean for traditional works of art, like classical paintings that have been admired and appraised for their tangible value in every brushstroke and record of curation? To discover how the world of classical art can intersect with crypto tech, crypto tech like blockchain, we speak with Wolfgang Bergman, Chief Financial Officer of Belvedere, one of the world's oldest museums and a world heritage site, as a compound of Baroque 18th century palaces housing art from the Middle Ages to today. The museum launched an NFT project of its own this February. Um, 10,000 digital pieces of the KISS completed by Austrian paint, painter Gustav Klimt in the earliest 20th century. Very warm welcome to you, Mr. Bergman. Thank you for joining us. And well, my first question to you, um, traditional art collections and blockchain, now they seem like two entirely different worlds. And it's rather incredible that you managed to translate the very expressive and opulent details of uh, Klimt's artwork as well in digital form. So first, could you fill us in on how the project is going and the technology behind it? Yes, um, hello from Vienna at first. Um, well, when, when we decided to, to, to enter the metaverse, um, we were looking for a creative and a, an, an unusual idea. And so at first we, we took the most famous uh, artwork uh, masterpiece we have on the one hand. On the other hand, um, we, we didn't only make a, a high res resolution digital copy, uh, but we divided it into 10,000 parts. And the special thing is each part results in a new, uh, unique and, and very expressive uh, uh, image. Uh, and on uh, further on, uh, a special feature is uh, that uh, you you can use this NFT as a declaration of love because you can dedicate uh, uh, this NFT. Um, and so all this together uh, makes makes it so special. And uh, we had uh, a, a technological uh, innovation because although it's an NFT and although uh, it's running on, on the, the Ether blockchain, uh, you do not need uh, crypto money to buy it, but you can buy it uh, with a uh, um, credit card on our platform. And Mr. Bergman, the KISS is one of the most famous and the most frequently reproduced works of art in the world. And it's easy to find it both online and in printed form as well. So what would make your NFT project a collectible uh, work of art in its own right? Uh, particularly when there are so many one-of-a-kind NFT artworks that are just popping up everywhere. So what would you say makes the KISS NFTs very unique and worth 100, uh, more than 1,800 euros each? Well, uh, at first, uh, the, the glimpsed the kiss uh, is is the most uh, famous uh, Austrian uh, artwork, uh, and it's one of the most famous um, uh, masterpieces in the world. So it's uh, it's so worth that nobody could could pay it. Uh, the, uh, this picture came directly from the artist uh, into the Belvedere. Uh, it has never been in a private ownership and it will never be uh, in a private ownership. Um, and uh, we, we, we see in the, in the world of art, uh, we see the phenomenon that uh, if there are a lot of merchandising products like posters, like t-shirts, uh, even like uh, fridge magnets, uh, that doesn't uh, devalue the artwork um, instead that makes it even more valuable. So as more as coffee cups are in the world, uh, as more 
um, uh, there is the, the, the value of the, of the kiss. And the same is with, with our NFTs, because there's only one original artwork and there is only one collection of uh, uh, NFTs and each tile is a one of a kind collectible because uh, uh, we don't have 10,000 kisses, but one kiss in 10,000 tiles, and that makes it uh, so worse. Well, so you get to be part of this incredible piece of art, really. And there are around uh, 2,400 of your Clint NFTs have been sold so far. And, well, that is less than a quarter of the total 10,000 pieces, though it has still generated an impressive $4.3 million. Well, how are you interpreting these numbers? And do you plan to mint NFTs of other artworks in the future? Uh, well, uh, to, to be honest, um, as it's a, a very new field for us um, and, and somewhat experimental, uh, we didn't know uh, uh, what, what to expect. Uh, but we consider the result uh, as a big success. Uh, to the date, it's the most successful NFT project with an historical artwork work worldwide. And of course, uh, we, we learned a lot now about the scene and, and we see that the NFT scene um, uh, seems to be a, a high speed scene. Some people seem to expect that everything has to be sold out uh, in a little uh, as an hour. Uh, however, as, as a museum, we might be able to slow these things a, a little bit down uh, uh, and we can say the kiss uh, is in our house um, uh, for 114 years uh, and he will be there uh, a lot of hundreds years. And so in 100 years, nobody will ask uh, whether uh, the, 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 the NFTs were sold out in a minute, uh, in a day, in a week or in a year. Um, uh, but um, so as a museum, we are not we are not uh, in hurry, uh, but we are sure that we will be sold out. And so as a buyer, you might be, you should be uh, in hurry. Right, so you might want to snap those um, up very quickly. Uh, but well, some see NFTs, Mr. Bergman, just like other digital tools and concepts such as the metaverse, as a rather temporary hype during the stretch of the pandemic. Do you think that NFT artworks simply replicate or simply enhance the experience of appreciating the original piece in its physical form? Or do you think they offer something distinctly different? Uh, well, I'm sure that the metaverse is not uh, not a hype, not only a hype. It's it's a part uh, of of the ongoing digitalization uh, of life, uh, and uh, metaverse uh, is becoming a part of our life. Um, but uh, it 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 will not uh, s substitute the real life. Uh, the, the physical visitor, um, uh, uh, the physical experience to go in a museum uh, will therefore always uh, remain uh, important. Uh, so uh, to explain it in that way, just because we can send each other kisses, kiss emojis with our um, uh, phones, uh, smartphones, uh, we will not stop uh, to have kisses in the real life. Uh, and so um, uh, it's, it's uh, a, a part of our life uh, which uh, is adding our life, but not substitute it, but what we have so far. I see. And while well, there have also been discussions on how um, NFTs and other digital trends have redefined how artwork is created, but how do they affect the curator's role? Well, we have to see that that um, NFT is to, to certify um, a, a, a product, uh, but 
uh, and so it, it certifies uh, for uh, art products, for example. Uh, but uh, the NFTs haven't so far changed the, the creative processes. Uh, what has changed is that especially digital art um, uh, uh, is getting easier to, to promote it um, uh, uh, because uh, at the first time uh, you have a, a digital uh, origin uh, uh, certificate, uh, which we had not bef uh, before uh, for a digital file. Uh, that's uh, that's changing the, the the market for for digital art, but it it it, it doesn't change the market for the classical art. Uh, it so the market is uh, the market is expanding. Uh, and we have to consider that our project uh, is not um, the NFT of a new artwork, uh, uh, but uh, what we did is transforming an, an existing artwork uh, into a digital copy uh, and uh, uh, in, into this individual pieces. So, it's a big uh, new um, world uh, which uh, NFTs uh, are showing, and there are very different ways uh, of using it. And now the Belvedere, it, uh, as an institution, I would say it's an artwork of its own right, right? It's a World Heritage Site, a Baroque jewel, and um, the site of the Austrian State Treaty. So it's both one of the oldest museums in the world, and now it's becoming one of the most open to digitalization. So how have you been using technology to translate your heritage into the digital space? And how do you envision the future of art exhibitions? Well, uh, it's our goal to be a leading museum uh, in both worlds, uh, uh, in the classical uh, museum and uh, in the digital world. Uh, and so we, we, we started um, uh, to have uh, the possibility to see our, all our collection without uh, traveling to Vienna. Uh, but I'm convinced uh, that will only increase uh, the desire to visit Vienna um, uh, and the, the Belvedere in person. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, uh, we have uh, digital exhibitions, we have digital conferences, uh, we have uh, a big um, uh, cooperation uh, with Google Culture and Arts. Uh, with with breathtaking um, uh, um, uh, recreating from lost uh, climped pictures, um, uh, uh, so we have we have a lot uh, uh, of new uh, uh, digital uh, things, uh, but uh, it's only a second world and not uh, uh, instead of the world we had so far. And now bringing South Korea into the picture, uh, South Korea is arguably a very tech savvy nation that embraces all things digital, uh, digital innovation in its culture. And well, you've collaborated with South Korea before. Your museum showcases some of your best of my pieces on Samsung's frame TV display. Now, do you see any room for further collaborations with South Korea? Where do you see this kind of potential? Well, a, a huge potential uh, you have to see uh, uh, until the, the pandemic started, uh, there was no other country in the world uh, from which so many people visited the Belvedere as from Korea. So we had in, 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 in 2000, 2019, we had uh, 200,000 visitors uh, uh, from, from uh, South Korea. Uh, and it, it, it was uh, lead, leading the, the ranking list. Uh, and we see how uh, interested uh, uh, and enthusiastic uh, uh, the people uh, in Korea are about the work of, of Gustav Klimt. Uh, uh, and we, we see the, the high uh, comp uh, uh, the te technology savvy uh, in your country. Uh, and so we are very interested in, 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 in cooperations. 
um, uh, and we are dealing with, with, with companies in, in, in South Korea. And now, uh, at the moment, uh, on this weekend, uh, we are presenting the KISS NFT at the Art Busan. Uh, and we will start our international roadshow for the NFT project uh, starting in Korea. And, and, uh, and then uh, we will go to New York. Uh, so I'm very glad uh, that, uh, that I have the possibility to, to come to Korea next week myself. And I'm very happy about it. Right. Well, I'm sure many of our viewers will be very excited too to, ch to check out these key events uh, happening in Busan and Seoul this month. And well, I'm afraid our time is up, so this is where we'll have to wrap up the interview. But that was Wolfgang Bergman, Chief Financial Officer of Belvedere. Thank you so much for your time today, and we hope you visit um, your visit to trip. Sorry, your trip to South Korea goes very well. See you soon in Korea. <laughs> South Korea's import prices edged down for the first time in four months as global oil prices dropped slightly in April. The Bank of Korea says the overall import price index last month stood at 147.9. That was a dip of 0.9 percent from March after three straight months of increases. However, it's still high compared to a year earlier as import prices last month were up more than 35 percent. The central bank attributed this to Dubai crude, Korea's benchmark falling more than 7 percent on month to an average of around 103 U.S. dollars a barrel. Export prices in April saw a rise for the fourth month in a row, up 1 percent from March, led by diesel and machineries. Now, there was a time when university students could gather at the grassy areas on campus to socialize and enjoy a bit of freedom. Well, fortunately, due to the pandemic, all college events and festivals were either canceled altogether or went online. Now they're back. Well, Kim bo Kyung files this report. The unrelenting pandemic had taken the highly anticipated campus life away from new university students. But now, with social distancing measures lifted, college festivals have returned. Major universities in South Korea are already busy planning their festival schedules, and among them is Seoul National University, which came up with the homecoming festival. The once quiet campus field is now filled with students enjoying the festival that is back in full and in person for the first time in three years. A variety of booths, food trucks and activities add to the festive atmosphere. One of the organizers says the festival wanted to welcome those who felt the effects of the pandemic the most, the classes of 2020 and 2021, as if they are coming back home. I believe a good festival helps students connect, makes them talk about the festival they enjoyed even years later. The main purpose is to let them bond and make new memories together. The festival seemed to do what it set out to, letting students really feel like they're on a university campus, making new friends. I got in last year but could hardly come to campus because of COVID-19. It's hard to imagine that we are actually having a festival here. Now I feel like a real college student. Yeah, I think it's our first time and I think it's super fun. The weather is super nice today and it's very nice to be outside, not how to wear a mask anymore and just enjoy the vibes, yeah. People who were in the year above me at high school told me that going to college wouldn't be anything special, so I was worried about being disappointed. But now we're having festivals and can meet many new friends. I feel so happy. University festivals being back and at full capacity has been welcomed by the vendors too. We went through such a tough period due to the virus, so having festivals like this gives us a lot of hope. Other major universities are also working out their festival plans to give students a place they can meet new people in person instead of on Zoom. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News.
Now for a look at news from around the world, we now turn to our Matthew Ashley standing by at the Arirang Newsroom. Good morning to you, Matthew. Good morning to you guys. Hi Matthew, let's start with the news of more wildfires in the United States. Now, news reports are sh uh, shedding light on one in California. That's right, Suyong. Uh, since Wednesday, a fire that's been pushed in by strong ocean winds into the city of Laguna Niguel has destroyed at least 20 homes and scorched around 80 hectares. Now, hundreds of residents have evacuated danger areas while firefighters spend the night fighting the blaze, going house by house. According to Orange County authorities, the fire has not been contained yet, with local emergency orders still in place. The cause of the blaze is under investigation. Dubbed the Coastal Wildfire, the blaze is relatively small compared to other major wildfires that can break out in western states. A series of wildfires have plagued the U.S. in recent months. Global shares sank to their lowest point in 18 months on Thursday, following inflation, rising interest rates and energy supply fears in Europe. This follows a warning from Germany that Russia is using energy supplies as a, quote, weapon to put pressure on Europe's stock 600 index. The global index is now almost 20% lower for the year to date. In the US, all three major stock indexes fluctuated before coming to a steep sell point or sell off putting the S&P 500 within a closing level that may confirm a bear market entry. Brent crude futures settled six cents lower at $107.45 a barrel, while U.S. crude oil futures ended 42 cents higher at $106.13 a barrel. The World Cup trophy started its global tour on Thursday, starting with a star-studded unveiling in Dubai. Marking its fifth global tour, the iconic gold trophy will be sent to 53 countries, including for the first time all 32 countries that qualified for the 2022 World Cup. Former Brazilian midfielder Kaká and former World Cup, or World Cup winning Spanish goalkeeper Iker Casillas joined the ceremony in Dubai. The tour allows fans to see the trophy up close and take pictures. Dating back to 1974, the World Cup trophy is made of solid gold. It can only be physically held by certain people, including former winners and heads of state. The 31st Southeast Asian Games have opened in the Vietnamese city of Hanoi after being delayed for a year due to the pandemic. Following a nationwide easing of antivirus restrictions, many spectators and athletes were seen without face masks during the two-hour opening ceremony. Vietnam's president was among the thousands of people enjoying the event. Hosted in Hanoi and 11 surrounding cities until May 23rd, the 18-day biennial games will see 5,000 athletes from 11 participating nations compete across 40 sports. Scientists on Thursday unveiled the first image of a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Called Sagittarius A star, it was photographed by the Event Horizon Telescope, marking only the second time such a phenomenon has been captured in an image. The central dark region in the picture is where the hole resides, surrounded by light coming from superheated gas accelerated by gravitational forces. Sagittarius A star is located about 26,000 light years away from Earth or uh, 9.5 trillion kilometers. It also has 4 million times the mass of our Sun. Good morning. Spring continues with above average temperatures in the capital, though readings will not be as high as yesterday. And today's rain in inland regions will actually put the brakes on the unseasonably warm temperatures. So it's going to be a breezy morning this weekend. Such regions are covered with lots of clouds this morning and the south is cloudier with some light rain on Jeju Island this morning. So if you're on Jeju, we'll need an umbrella on your way out. In fact, rain is in the forecast through the afternoon. In the regions, we'll see some spotty passing rain during the day, which will make temperatures drop back in most parts of the country. But first, let's check on our morning temperatures. Central regions are having lows that are 3 degrees higher than yesterday, similar in southern provinces. 
While rain affected areas and the East Coast will see readings below norms, going to topping out at just 18 degrees Celsius, table at 21 degrees this afternoon with lots of clouds. But skies should clear up just in time for the weekend. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. Well, that wraps up our newscast for this morning, but we will be back again for our Monday's edition of New Day at Arirang. Thanks again for joining us this morning and stick around for more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are. And as always, take care. Welcome to Daegu. Bienvenue, Daegu. Hi, nice to meet you. Daegu, welcome. Alampi, Daegu. Bienvenido, Daegu. Welcome you all for the first time in Korea.